Our safety training topic for the month of June will be walkout, tag out, and verify. And what you see here is a picture that I took several years ago of an employee, unfortunately. He was working on a machine that all that it really did was it took coiled up wire and ran it through a series of feed wheels to kind of straighten every all the wire out. And then two cutters would come down and cut that wire to length. And that was called the straight and cut machine. Now, the problem with this straight and cut machine is that sometimes with all those feed wheels, it didn't take a whole lot for the machine to get all jammed up with wire, and it kind of looked like a fishing reel. If you've ever backlashed a fishing reel, that's what this would look like sometimes. Uh, so this employee, he took it upon himself to open up the cabinet door and where all the feed wheels were being housed, and he got his hand in there, and he started to untangle all the wire that was bunched up in there. And unfortunately, he removed uh, the wrong wire at the wrong time, I suppose, and that machine still had about half of a stroke uh, left in it. Uh, so when he pulled that, that wire that was holding everything back, his finger was in the wrong spot and his finger got pulled through uh, a set of feed wheels as they came together and smashed his finger off. And that's what you're seeing there. Uh, so that is a reminder that I like to start out with that clearing a machine jam falls under lockout, tag out, verify. You don't wanna just jump in there and start clearing a jam uh, until you've gone through the lockout, tag out, and verify that there's no energy left in that machine. Otherwise, you start running into uh, risks like you can see there. Let's see if we can get this video to play real quick. Our operator comes up to his machine. Maybe he came off of a lunch break. He tries to start his machine, but his machine won't start, so somebody turned the power off. He turns the power back on, but our maintenance guy was in there. That's classic uh, lockout, tagout territory that you see there. If only that maintenance person had put on his, had shut off the machine, done his lock, tag, verify, and then told the operator what was about to happen, none of that would have happened. And uh, here's another uh, terrible situation where a worker was accidentally killed when he was trapped inside of a massive pressure cooker. This employee was loading tuna into the cooker when the cooker was activated by an employee standing outside. Uh, this employee was cooked alive in the pressure cooking vessel along with 1,200 pounds of tuna. His coworker thought he had gone to the restroom, and so the coworker then initiated the startup sequence. Unfortunately, his coworker was in that machine, and he was not aware of that. Let's see if we can get this video to pull up real quick. Here's a guy. He's getting on top of a conveyor belt. Maybe he's doing an inspection maybe about to do some type of work on something we don't know, but this conveyor belt uh, doesn't seem to be running at the time. But then for some reason, that conveyor belt starts up. Maybe somebody down the line pushed the button to turn it on, didn't know the guy was up there. So he obviously didn't go through his lockout, tagout, tryout, or lockout, tagout, verify. I, I use those terms interchangeably, I'm talking about the same thing. But anyway, uh, yeah, this guy gets stuck, but he, he's, he's lucky, he survives. Um, don't know how bad his injuries were at the time, but they eventually get him all pulled out of there. So this is not to scare you, but in a way it kind of is. You need to definitely respect the machines that you're working around and, um, and understand your role when it comes to lockout, tagout. And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, as we go through this presentation a little bit more. You can see he, he's conscious, he's alive but uh, definitely something that could have been avoided. Okay, so moving on, what is the purpose of lockout, tagout, verify? And that's to remove or neutralize all hazardous energy sources that are present uh, before you begin working on them, uh, to prevent the accidental activation of any hazardous energy source until the lockout has been completed. And why do we do that? As you've seen now, and as I've told you and I showed you these other cases, these machines don't have any brain of their own. You have to use your own. Uh, they will eat you up and, and spit you out the other end, uh, just like they do whatever whatever it, it, the product is that they're working with. Uh, it, it'll it'll treat you just the same way. So, and lockout, tagout, and the training part of this is so important uh, for everyone to to understand. 
but it's kind of like uh, imagine it's your first day on a new job and just imagine you had never uh, seen a mouse trap you have no idea what a mouse trap is all about but your boss hands you a bag of cheese and says hey first day on the job we've got 100 mouse traps and all the cheese needs to be changed out on them well how long do you think it's going to take you to figure out what a mouse trap does so that's that's why this training and it is so important and knowing the procedures uh, and of course written lockout tag out procedures are required for any machine that has two or more energy sources and this is just the the big picture of, of the lockout tag out process first thing to do is, is to identify the energy sources their potential hazards, and then all the control devices that, that this authorized person is going to need to control the energy. They're going to notify all the affected employees. They'll then turn off all the operating controls. They'll locate the energy sources and isolate them or, uh, or relieve any stored energy that's in that system. They will then do their lockout. So all switches and energy controls are in the off or safe position. And then this is, this is the important part, is the test part or the verify part. Uh, so they'll test the operating controls by put all, putting all the controls in the on position. And of course, be sure nobody can get hurt before testing. And so they'll try every which way to make sure that this machine will not, cannot start up. And then once they've verified, they're going to return all those controls to the off position. They're going to perform their required task. And then when they're done, they're going to remove all the lockout, tag out devices and uh, alert all the affected employees that they're finished and that the machine's about to be powered back up again. And each lockout device must be removed by the person who put it on. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So we've got two types of employees in any given situation. You're either going to be authorized or you're going to be affected. And here's our definitions. Our authorized employees, they've been trained on how to lock and tag out the equipment and how to deal with the hazards of the energy sources that are present throughout their facility. Authorized employees shall notify the affected employees, that's the other set of employees, um, when they apply a lockout and remove a lockout. Authorized employees shall not remove any lockout devices or locks that they did not apply themselves. In order to ensure the safety of the authorized employees during maintenance, it's crucial to supply proper training regarding lockout tagout, obviously. The training shall include the steps needed to lock out the equipment, how to follow a lockout procedure, and the company's policy uh, regarding any type of special lockout tagout circumstances. And finally, annual audits shall be conducted for each authorized employee to see that they can physically demonstrate the proper lockout tagout procedures for their equipment. So like I said, if you're not authorized, then you're affected, okay? Those are employees uh, who are affected by the lockout, which means their work involves the equipment that is being locked out and their job will be affected during a lockout. Uh, some examples of an eff affected employee can be an operator uh, who is not authorized to do lockout on their own equipment, um, or it could even be an office worker whose heating or air conditioning unit is being worked on as this affects his or her work environment. So that guy I showed you with the, the missing fingertip, he was an operator, but he was not qualified as an authorized person to perform the lockout tagout. And uh, when he took it upon himself to clear the jam himself without the proper training, he was putting himself at risk. And you can see that he got hurt. He should have stopped um, when that jam occurred and then called maintenance as they, are, they were the authorized people. And then they would come over, initiate the proper sequence, clear the jam safely. Uh, let's see here. Affected employees are not allowed to lock out equipment. Therefore, if they see a piece of equipment that is locked out, they need to be trained to not touch or mess with that equipment or the lockout devices. If they're an operator whose equipment is being locked out, then during that process, they should go and do other work uh, until maintenance is completed and that lockout is removed. Any, effect, any affected employee whose work will be directly affected by the lockout will be notified when both the lockout is going to be applied and when it will be removed and they will be notified by the authorized employees doing that job. And then we move on to some common examples of hazardous energy. That could be electrical, hydraulic, pneumatic, mechanical, uh, kinetic energy, things like gravity, and of course springs stored under, uh, springs under tension like our, our mousetrap example. Um, and hot, molten, pressurized, or otherwise dangerous, that could be chemicals, any type of fluids like that in pipelines. Uh, thermal energy is another big one and then stored energy like what well, you could find in batteries or capacitors. And I just included this weird example, even, even Jaguars could be an example of uh, hazardous energy. 
Well, back in 2007, this happened. OSHA fined the Denver Zoo because a zookeeper uh, was attacked by a jaguar while he was trying to clean out the, the enclosure. And for whatever reason, that hazardous energy, the jaguar, uh, was not locked up. And it got out and it hurt this uh, zookeeper who actually killed him. It says there, uh, the zookeeper died as a result uh, of that jaguar attack. So that's just another way to, to look at it. We have to be careful, um, even for things like our hand tools that are just plugged into the wall, um, or maybe it's just an airline or something like that. We have to be careful to, uh, if we're going to be doing any type of troubleshooting or messing with that tool whatsoever, at least unplug it from all of its energy sources and then try to get that thing to operate. And if it doesn't, then you're probably safe from there. But don't, uh, don't just assume just because you unplug a piece of equipment from the wall that there's not some stored energy still left in there. So that's the verify or the tryout part of, of, of the lockout tagout. Many employees have been injured or killed even when using lockout tagout. However, the verify tryout part of the procedure was skipped. And so these machines can still store residual energy and they can still hurt you. And so if you see a situation like this, classic lockout tagout situation, uh, we're going to talk about the coloring of the locks here in just a minute. So the good news is if you are an authorized employee and you have a type of energy you want to lock out and isolate, uh, there's there's all sorts of devices out there uh, to control the energy. And you can see here, um, light switches can be locked out, like you see. Things like airlines can be locked out. Uh, and then you can see your, your power panel there on the right. There's a spreader bar that someone can apply and lock and tag that out so nobody has access. Um, all your valve handles, somebody makes a type of device that will lock and tag that out. Individual breakers can be locked out. And here in the uh, the bottom middle, this is the uh, plug-in, uh, the, the power receptacle. Um, if there's a um, some machine that you're working on that you have to unplug from the wall and you don't want anybody to use it while you're working on it, you can put that canister over there and those holes match up and then you can lock and tag out from there so that nobody can plug that in while you're working on it. And then there are things like physical blocks and you can see on the dump truck here somebody has taken a steel bar and put it in place as a backup in case this fails. Things like uh, chalking your wheels can be considered physical blocks to keep your equipment from rolling off. And then physical blocks for things like presses are very important. This is just uh, solid iron uh, press blocks that go into place so that if somebody's doing maintenance and they have to put their their head and their shoulders and arms in between these two press plates if uh, if the pressure were to release suddenly and unexpectedly uh, these safety blocks are physical blocks that are going to keep those press plates from coming together so that person doesn't get smashed uh, forklift mechanics I've seen them do this before where they chain their forks they lift those forks all the way up on the mast and then they take a chain and they chain uh, the forks to the mast and put a lock on it, and that qualifies as a lockout tagout. This guy here, he's using boomsticks that go in place here, and that's because he's got to work underneath here, but he's got to raise this up. If this thing were to come down on him, obviously it, it might come down very quickly and might crush him. So they have uh, devices that will hold that open. Now that does not count. Good effort, but um, that's not what we're looking for. We don't like that. <laughs> All right. And so here's some pretty handy devices. These uh, steel cable lockout devices. And you can see from these pictures how they operate. Uh, very handy. You can just thread this through. And then there's a tensioner on here that you can tighten it down. And then you put your lock and tag on. And people can operate these devices here. And you can see if you've got a, a bank of these power panels, uh, you can thread your steel cable through tension them down and do your lockout tag out and nobody can throw those panels into the on position. So those, those come in handy in a lot of situations. If you don't already already have those, I highly suggest you get three or four of those. Uh, there's been plenty of cases I've worked on where somebody traditional lockout tag out couldn't get it done. Um, they didn't have the right devices, but we happen to have one of these and we could uh, arrange it in such a way that it would do uh, an effective lockout for us. So I definitely suggest uh, look into those and put those into your lockout tagout kits. Very, uh, very flexible devices. 
we want to make sure that pipes are drained and then blocked off for obvious reasons so we don't wind up like this guy over here. You can separate these pipes at the flanges. You put your skillet, what they call skillet blank in there, and then uh, you can put those back together and it's uh, physically blocked off. Or you can just separate them all together and block off each end. And even on top of that, after you've put your, your blank in, you want to go ahead and lock it out uh, the rest of the way. They make a lockout device for that so nobody can undo it while you're downstream. And then even things like your compressed gas cylinders can be locked and tagged out as well so that they can't be used. And um, earlier you might have saw a situation where there was a hasp, and that's the hasp with the six holes in it. Um, that's a lockout device that allows for group lockout where more than one person is going to be performing a lockout situation. And I've worked at, um, at places where we had to do a, a one month shutdown on a, on a, on a big mill. And uh, that didn't require just one or two people. That required 60 or 70 people all at the same time. And so we had our lock boxes set up and we had the good thing about these hasps. You can put them in place. And then you can put five locks on, and then that last hole right there, you put another hasp in there, and then you carry on five locks at a time until you've accounted for every single person involved in that lockout situation. And uh, for smaller uh, group lockout tagout scenarios, that's what this is for. And it looks like you can get about 12 people on there, plus this, this lock here would belong to the, the boss of the job, essentially, maybe the, the head maintenance person uh, for the shift or the head electrical person for the shift. And uh, their lock would be the last one to come off. Uh, the people put their keys in here and nobody can get into this box until every last person has removed their own lock. So everyone is represented. It doesn't matter if you're the big boss or if you're the guy who's just in there sweeping up um, the mess after everyone's done. Everyone involved in that situation is represented with a lock and a tag, no exception. Okay, we'll move on. When is it acceptable for someone else to remove your lock during a lockout? Uh, so is it when the person who owns the lock has finished their shift and left their lock on? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, when you give that person your key, definitely not. Um, that doesn't work that way. Uh, or your supervisor can remove your lock at any time that they wish. No, it doesn't work like that either. So typically, the answer is going to be never. There is one exception, and that is if a person leaves their lock on and then they go home and they forget to take their lock off. Uh, but there is a process that upper management has to follow. It's actually a permit system. Uh, so there is a lock removal form that has to be filled out. And we have to verify uh, that the absent authorized person who applied his lock is no longer present at the site. They need to make all reasonable efforts to contact that person. And usually what I've seen is if somebody forgets, uh, their, their boss will call them on their cell phone and have them come right back and remove it. Um, and then they make all reasonable efforts to inform that person, that person's supervisor, that that lock has been removed. So after obtaining, uh, obtaining all those approvals, the shift electrical or maintenance person, typically, uh, your, your mileage may vary, depends on how your location does it, they have to remove the locks with some bolt cutters. And so if that uh, supervisor is present uh, to physically witness the lock removal, they should be there and they need to retain possession of the cut locks. And um, before that absent person returns to, to the job site to continue their work, that supervisor is going to meet them at the gate and uh, tell them, hey, you forgot your lock. Uh, we cut your lock off and the lockout tag out uh, is not the way that it was when you left it, so you need to be aware of that. And that's how the law goes in. And, uh, and that's what the, the permit is for. The lock removal form is to, to give people a, a, a guide on how to, to go through all these steps and make sure that everything is as, as safe as possible. And of course, we keep the, lock, the completed lock form uh, on file for record keeping. But if you guys are ever going to be doing any type of a big shutdown, and it's going to take a, a lot of contractors and employees putting locks on and taking them off. Best thing you can do is post up some of these signs at your entry and exit gates uh, so that these folks remember uh, not, not to leave their locks and tags on. And there's, so there's a common OSHA violation a lot of people don't know about. Your lockout, uh, tag out locks cannot be used to secure lockers, toolboxes, or any other items not directly related to lockout, tag out. So it's always a good practice to make all of your lockout locks um, red or, or at least one uniform color. 
uh, for easy verification. That way, if I walk into a locker room, I shouldn't see a bunch of red locks hanging off the of lockers. Um, red locks or, or whatever color you designate need to go onto the, the, the machines for lockout tagout purposes only. And then uh, anything that is not that designated color can go at that point on your toolboxes, on your lockers, whatever the case is. Now there are some certain circumstances where tag out alone um, may be the only way. Uh, now with that said, if you encounter a situation where you can't lock something out, you need to alert your supervisor and we need to figure out a way if we can, if at all possible, to be able to put a lock on there to physically lock and tag, lock out that machine. But if not, tag out can be used by itself, but it's definitely not ideal because anybody can come up and, and rip that tag off or just disregard it and use that piece of equipment. And so we don't like that. Uh, definitely need to find ways to lock out everything. But uh, if you're out there in your work site and you see a power tool that's got a, a do not operate tag hanging off of it, don't use it. There's probably something very, very wrong with it. You can get hurt. And especially if you're about to get onto a forklift and you see that it's got a tag like that hanging off of the steering wheel, who knows, the brakes could be out on that and uh, it could be immediately dangerous. So you don't want to just uh, disregard that tag. And I, I've had people do that before. And they next thing you know, they're running to the plant on a forklift, with no brakes. So uh, a good situation, a good example of that, if you wanted to tag out or lock and tag out a forklift, is go ahead and that that mechanic would go ahead and take those keys to operate that lift and put it in in his pocket. Uh, disconnect the battery, disconnect any any type of fuel source, and um, and uh, go from there. So here's. Uh, kind of a quick example of what's wrong here picture. So the way that I try to explain this, this is like a really bad tag out situation. It looks like somebody might be trying to work on this equipment and we don't know if they've got lockout or not, but it looks like they just took some pink tape and wrapped it up around these buttons trying to say, hey, don't push these. Well, that's great and all, but first off, that doesn't physically stop anybody from doing that. And then you know, somebody could accidentally go up there and, and bump into those buttons while that person is in that machine. Uh, so that's just a mess all the way around. That's, uh, that's what bad lockout tagout looks like. Um, and then here's the, the other what's wrong here picture. And I think you can see it. That's uh, pretty obvious there that that plastic piece is broken. And that lock is just there for looks at this point. It's not really doing anything. It might look safe from a distance, but once you get up on there and, and really look at it, you can see what's wrong. So it's not really offering any protection. But um, that's pretty much the, the, the long and short of lockout tagout. So I thank you for your time and thank you for your attention.